Welcome back, everyone. This is Christopher Paolini, of course, and today I'm talking with the awesome Tony Dieterlitzi. Hey, Tony. Hey, Chris. How are you? It's good to be here. Now, for those who don't know, which uh, is, I, I'd be surprised if anyone doesn't know, but for those who don't know, uh, Tony has uh, both co-written and co well, illustrated, I should say, uh, uh, the Spiderwick Chronicles. Uh, you both wrote and uh, illustrated uh, the the Wonderlaw series, and this year you have a sort of a art book, a retrospective book coming out, which I actually wrote the foreword for, which was lots of fun. And uh, am I missing any major major projects here, or anything else that's going on? And of course, a long you've had a long, long career as an illustrator for Dungeons and Dragons and Magic: The Gathering and all sorts of other awesome, awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. No, you've got that's a nice that's a nice uh, greatest hits. That was nicely done. Thank you. I try. <laughs> I try. Well, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the art book? Because I think that's a really cool project. I'm super psyched about it. It's um, you know, I like you said, I had started. Um, my career illustrating for for Dungeons and Dragons right out of art school actually I graduated in 92 and um, and I moved back home after art school I don't know if you know this story actually I don't know if I've told it to you but I um, I moved back home after art school and I was hanging out with a bunch of my friends and we started talking about uh, Dungeons and Dragons and and how much we loved playing it in the 80s and and the old original editions and we thought wow wouldn't it be cool to go back and play it now that we're like in our 20s. I would play the game so different. I would be so much more um, strategic about it, you know, than, than when you're a kid. You just, it's like learning chess. You're just trying to remember what all the pieces do. You're not thinking about strategy as much. At least I didn't. So we got together the next night and um, uh, the story went, I, I was missing one of the core books. I had the DMG, the Dungeon Master's Guide. I had the Player's Handbook, but I was missing the Monster's Manual, which is like my favorite book of all time, obviously, because I love monsters. And I went to the bookstore, and in the late 80s and early 90s, they had revamped the Monster Manual. I don't know if you noticed, and it was like a giant three-ring binder. And it was, they re-illustrated it, and the art just didn't seem as inspiring as it was when I was a kid. And a lot of my friends are like, dude, you should send art to, to TSR. I, I, I sent the stuff in, and they totally rejected all of it. Um, and um, I was really, really bummed out about that. And, um, so I, but I thought it was kind of a cool challenge because I, I, I don't want to say it and sound arrogant. I just thought I was, I was like, I could do it. I thought I was good enough technically. And so to me, it was almost like a puzzle as to why they, they didn't want to use me. They didn't give me a lot of feedback. They just kind of gave me a form letter. just said, Hey, great stuff. You know, keep sending us samples, right? What do you do with that? You don't, you know what, you don't know what to do with that. So, um, I called them. I just called them. I mean, this is before anyone had email or, or, or anything. I mean, this is like hard line phone. And I got, I got the uh, art director. Uh, I called like three times and I kept hanging up. I was so scared. I'm like, I'm going to call them. I'm just going to find out what's up. And then they'd, the phone would ring. I go, oh, what am I doing? Who am I? Who the hell do I think I am? Like, how, how can I call these guys? You know, I'm just like some 20 something. And then finally I got the art director on the phone. I mustered up the, 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 the brave, the bravado to do it. And um, this woman with like a Midwest accent, which I can't really do, but she's like, oh, hello, how are you? Tony Dieterlisi, we love your work. It was so good. And I'm like, why did you reject it? And she's like, well, all you did was draw monsters. Because it's all I drew was just, mo just a floating piece of paper with a monster. Just it's like everything I'd learned in art school, I had just thrown out. And just run, here's a beholder, here's a, you know, a rust monster. And so um, she said, you know, make them, you got to show players and, and characters and, and you need to show scenes and you need to show the monsters fighting the players or, or defending things. And, and, and it was like a duh, you know, like, I, I don't know how, why I didn't like, it didn't click for me. So through the, through that entire summer, I just kept sending them stuff over and over again. And in the fall, they gave me my first assignment and I worked for TSR through almost the entire nineties. Even after they were, even after they were bought by Wizards of the Coast, I learned so much during that period of my life. I really, really did. I could not do the books I do today without the, the time I spent working for those. Guys. It's all world building. I mean, massive world building. Well, you can't you can't draw an imaginary 
let's say, car or space vehicle without putting a lot of thought into how it actually functions and why that cool Guga is there at that particular spot on the ship. And so now, but your your so the art book that's coming out is a collection of a lot of your TSR yeah. artwork, right? So I'm super super excited about it. It's it's a big book as you can see, um, and um, I did not think that there was enough art from that period of my life that would warrant an art of book, to be honest. I mean, you kind of, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm very much like looking at the thing I'm working on now. I'm always thinking about the next thing that I'm working on. It's, it's like, it doesn't matter anything else you've done the rest of your life. None of it matters. It's just the one thing you're working yes, on now. That's it. My whole world is that it's, everything's on the line for that book that, you know, what is that book going to do? How is, you know, how, um, how will I improve as a as a creator as a as a storyteller? Will will um will people like it? Will it be reviewed well? Will the the publishers support it? Like those, you know that that's all the stuff that's always on the front of my mind. And um, anytime anyone ever asked me about will you do an art of book, I was like, ugh, not until I'm like really old. I'm just not interested. You know, I just felt like I, I haven't done enough living. I haven't created enough stuff yet. So when um. Dennis Kitchen and his partner John Lenz approached me and were like, "We would, we think you've got enough art in your in your gaming stuff that you could do an art of book." And I was like, "Really? I don't know. There's some there's some tankers in there, man." <laughs> but I, you know, it's amazing if you if you cull through a decade's worth of art and pluck all the pretty pieces out, it makes me look like I was technically better than I really was. <laughs> Well, that, that's the trick, isn't it? You only put the good pieces in your portfolio. But, and, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not really a trick either. I mean, that's just, you know, it's, it's the principle of putting your best foot forward. And I think every artist, no matter what they work in, is, is that's what you're striving for. You know, you don't put your first draft forward because it's your first draft, you know. And unless you happen to be some transcendent genius that gets it, you know, 100% right the first time, uh, which is what maybe one percent of one percent of one percent. Uh, the rest of us, you know, you 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 work on it. Yeah, yeah, over and over oh, yeah. and over. It's always a process. Um, and when I looked back at a lot of that art, I felt a weird mixture of like, oh, that's, some of that stuff's not bad, and also like, oh man, like that eye, that <laughs> foot, all the stuff that I was. You could see. All I can see are the mistakes. Yeah. But hey, you know, people loved it, so you can't you can't beat yourself up too badly about it. Sometimes you have to just stop analyzing it and just go along for the ride. And that's I've I've learned to do that with certain things that I can't overanalyze it. I just need to um accept that people really like this thing for whatever it is and don't mess with it. Let it just be its thing. You know? Yeah, I just had that exact same experience with uh my second book. I for business reasons I had to go back and look at some plot points and some stuff in in the book and I was reading some sections and just cringing, absolutely cringing that, you know, I did the very best I could at the time I wrote the story. And of course, now I have a lot more experience. And so I'm looking back at it thinking, you know, I would do this differently. That word strikes me as awkward or pretentious, especially pretentious. And it's like, well, you know, I'd cut that, I'd change that. And then, oh my, geez, it's already published. People have read this. You know, I can't do anything. And then I, and then I, and then I had to back off and remind myself that, uh, like I just said, you know, to you is that people have already enjoyed this work for good or for ill. It's out there. They've enjoyed it. They've loved it. So, you know, don't, you can't freak out about it and you just move forward and, uh, continue to grow as an artist. So, so I, now I, I have really been looking forward to this, uh, this interview with you because you're one of the few people who has sort of covered both sides of the spectrum with regard to art, visual art and writing. And yeah. there are a lot, and I think there are a number of writers who have been, you know, dabbled in illustration on their on the side. You know, Tolkien's perhaps one of the more famous examples, but he's not the only one. Uh, you know, uh, Tad Williams has done it. Uh, Victor Hugo was an artist in his free time. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, he was actually pretty decent. Uh, a whole bunch. I mean, uh, uh, Mervyn Peake, although he he went the other direction. He started as an artist and then became an art author. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that seems much less common for artists to become writers than for writers to become artists. Um, I mean, yeah. currently, you're probably the most prominent example, along with, of course, Brahm. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm curious to hear how that was for you. I mean, how did you get into the writing? How much of a how much did you participate in the writing with uh, the Spiderwick Chronicles? Right. And then what's it been like now to be sort of the sole author of your books moving forward? 
Well, I think um, I was a kid. I don't know if this was how it was for you, but I always drew. I always doodled. There'd be, um, you know, in class, my teacher would be talking and I'd be the kid in the back of the class that's just writing or drawing. And I never drew a um, single scene. I always, it was always a thread in a longer uh, story that was playing out in my mind. You know what I'm saying? And so it was never like, it was just a moment in a long series of moments. It was never just a, a posed scene. I, I, that was never how I drew. So I would make a lot of sound effects when I draw. I'd be like, you know, because in my head, there's a whole story on spooling as I'm working. And I think even when I do, like if I'm just doodling, like if I'm just killing time at a restaurant or, or sitting with my daughter at the table and we're just drawing and I'm just, I'm just absolutely just drawing stuff, it ultimately starts to grow a narrative. There's ultimately like, oh, I'm going to draw this character, but they're missing a leg. Why are they missing a leg? What did they do? Are they pirates? Are they da-da-da? You know, it always starts out innocently, and then my brain starts filling in all these places. And so I think I was... Um, I naturally wanted to be a storyteller. So you're, you, you, you know, you're doing the, the, the illustration, you're telling stories with that, and then how does that end up transitioning to becoming an actual author? When I made the rounds in the uh, late 90s in New York, we moved to New York City, uh, my wife and I, and um, I made the rounds and got nowhere. I mean, I just, no one was interested in my, they were interested in my art, but they didn't know what to do with me. I think because my art was so fantastic, you know, so dr obviously drawn upon fantasy elements with a little bit of science fiction. Um, and it wasn't until um, uh, Angela, my wife, met um, this woman who was with Scholastic Book Fairs and, and was able to, to just sell me way better than I could sell myself and, and get a name. And I was able to go in and meet with the folks at Scholastic that the editor there was like, your stuff's really cool. Do you, do you write? It might be easier to, to have you write your own stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't think it's good. And he was like, well, just send it. Just send it. Let me, let me see. I'll be the judge of it. And I remember faxing over, literally hand-drawn. My first picture book manuscript was just handwritten out. And I'm faxing it. And he called me up and said, we can work with this. This is good. So I needed a lot of confidence bolstering because I, I think um, I didn't know if I was any good or not. I felt like I had cool ideas that I hadn't seen in books, but I didn't think um, I was good enough. And that... Um, would have been like 1999, and from there till now, I have dedicated so much time to learning the craft of writing and getting the stories out of my head and constructing them into a way that I hope readers would really, you know, get something and enjoy it. It takes as much time as learning to paint, doesn't it? It is, oh, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. Well, you know, you Spiderwick know. had an interesting genesis because in in 1982, um, I was. Uh, 13 year, 12 going on 13 years old. And my mom had also purchased a book for me that changed my life, and it was called um, Brian Froud's and Alan Lee's Fairies book. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that book? Of the big course. white book? Of course. Brian Froud, of course, goes on to design The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth with Jim Henson, and Alan Lee goes on to design. Do you know? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings! Da -da! Right? <laughs> it's just huge, right? These two dudes yeah. sitting in a, you know, an English countryside like, let's draw fairies. All right, have a go. You know, like, and then it's just... <laughs> and my head just exploded when I saw that. I'd grown up with fairy tales. I'd grown up looking at Arthur Rackham's art, but that just took it to a whole other level for me. I was so inspired by that book. And... Um, and so I spent one summer, I also love um, uh, science and natural history. Mm -hmm. And growing up in Florida, I was the kid who would come home with jars full of bugs and lizards and snakes and stuff like that. I was a Boy Scout. I was into all of, I loved being out in nature. I loved all of that stuff. And I had, I had the little golden uh, field guides. I don't know if you remember those. They were like oh, yeah. the little pocket guides. I had all of them. And so I, I, I remember sitting in my, my bedroom and I wondered if... What if I drew a dragon, but I, but I, in the, the text wasn't like, like the monster manual and it wasn't a story or a fairy tale, but was like natural history type writing. This, this dragon prefers this kind of climate. It's active during this times a year, this time of the year. It feeds on these certain things. These are what its footprints look like. This is how long the adults will reach, you know, all that kind of scientific 
um, knowledge and recording, but being applied towards a fantastic animal. And um, because Dungeons and Dragons turned me then on to Tolkien, it turned me on to Greek and classic mythology. It was like a gateway to all of that stuff for me. So I was reading like all about you know um, uh, you know uh, Perseus and 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 Medusa and 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 Bellerophon and 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 the Chimera and you know the Minotaur and Theseus. Like I was reading all of that stuff, just sucking it all in, and. Um, so I'm like, well, what if I drew this stuff, but with a scientific bend? So I filled this notebook by the end of the summer, 12 years old, filled it, filled it with all these drawings. I still have it. And, and, uh, and I forgot about it. It was done and I went on to do whatever else I did. And my third um, picture book was The Spider and the Fly. And it be, was my first New York Times bestseller. And it won um, the Caldecott honor uh, back in 2002, 2000, yeah, 2002. And I will never forget this. My editor, Kevin Lewis, who I did a lot of books with for many years at Simon Schuster, he looked at me and said, you can do any kind of book you want. What do you want to do? We'll, we'll get behind whatever you want to do next. You know? And you're just like, who gets, who gets asked that, right? And I thought, what, what? this is pivotal for me, actually, um, um, because it affects the way I think about every other book from here on in. I asked myself what I would have wanted as a kid that doesn't exist. I was like, what book is out there that doesn't exist that I wish I had when I was 10, when I was 12? And I thought back on this, this field guide that I made. So I brought it in, and he and I began to hash out the mythology of Arthur Spiderwick. This field guide became Arthur Spiderwick's field guide. And at a certain uh, point, I realized it was getting bigger bigger it went from one book that i want i wanted to do my version of fairies but i wanted manticores and and griffins and all this stuff in it and um and holly started helping me do research on the folklore and i'd known holly for a couple of years at that point and she, and she was trying to get her first young adult novel published which angela my wife helped her get published and at a certain point i realized i can't i can't do all of this it's too much for me and i knew that my um lack of confidence and, and um, inability to be a really good writer would, would hamstring the Spiderwick Chronicles. I knew I wasn't good enough, and I knew Holly was. And Holly and I were friends. I mean, she and I would talk the way you and I are talking today. We still do. And we would just sit and hash out that plot. And we would love, we would go see a movie and then destroy the movie. We'd tear it down to tiny pieces Figure out what worked and what didn't work, what was good, what was inventive, what wasn't, the, the really interesting stuff. And I knew we had we could do that then with our own story. And that's how Spiderwick started started to come together. So do you write sequentially once you have your outline locked down, start to finish? Yes. I can't. Holly works the other way. Holly will bounce around. On Spiderwick, she would do that. And I, I was completely perplexed I, I it was so different than me and she would she would write big i guess it's kind of like how i start out with the where she'd write big scenes and another big scene and eventually she just just dovetail it together i can't do that no well, my problem with doing that and i admire people who can but my problem is that everything that happens earlier in the story informs what happens later so i can't just i can't just jump three quarters into the book and write the scene because i need to spend those couple hundred pages getting in the characters' heads and experiencing what they experience. And then, I don't know about you, but sometimes by the time I get to that scene three quarters of the way through the book, I find that I write it completely differently than I originally imagined now that I know the characters, now that I know the world, now that I know actually what happens in excruciating detail leading up to it. You get to the end, and then you're like, oh, now I know how to write the beginning, right? I mean, you, yeah. you don't really know them as well. It's like, go on. And you, and, and go ahead. you get to the end, and you go... Oh, that's what the book is about. Yes! Yes! Oh, that's the theme. That happens to me. That's happened a couple times where I thought I knew what the theme was. And then I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing. And I get to the end of the first chapter and go, oh, it's not yeah. about what this. And I have found that ultimately all that stuff is subconsciously stuff that's going on in my life. There's re the reality of what's happening in my life. I feel diverse. I don't think it at the time, but I when I look back, back on the concepts and stuff that, I, that are in those, the books, I feel like it's very much um, going on in the background. It's happening on, in the back of my brain. 
I, I think most of my readers would be shocked to realize how much of my writing is autobiographical, despite the fact there are dragons and monsters and other things running around. I, I don't find that surprising at all. I have always gravitated towards dragons and monsters um, because many times in my childhood, I felt like I was the monster. I felt like I was the weird kid in a classroom. I wasn't, um, I, w I was just a nerd. I, I wouldn't say I was like unpopular, but I certainly wasn't popular. And the stuff that I loved just wasn't trendy or popular. And so I felt like a freak. I felt like, a, you know, I love to draw. Not a lot of kids like to draw by the time you're in high school, you know? It, it's, it is no longer derogatory to be called a nerd or a geek. You know, people wear that, that flag proud. But when I was a kid, it was, you know, you were going to get beat up, you know, especially in Florida, you know, which it just, Florida. No, I mean, I, in, especially in like middle school and high school, when you have things like sports that are, are very highly supported or in my high school, the marching band was really big. And those aren't bad things, you know, but they're not everything. And not everyone is conducive to, to participate in that. And I was definitely, you know, the 17 year old that weighed like 80 pounds. I was that Norman Rockwell painting with the skinny kids lifting the weights and it didn't matter. I was like a praying man that's holding weights. It just didn't matter. You know what I mean? So I, um, that's why I like monsters. I, I, I've often felt, I don't know if that's the same for you, but that's, I think why I, I, uh, you misunderstood, you know, like a monster, a monster is the most easily, I, you know, to me is always an icon for something that's misunderstood. Well, you know, I think that's one of the great things about fantasy is it allows you to empathize with people and creatures you never would otherwise, and to see yourself in situations and that you could never experience otherwise. And, sometimes to escape the situation you're in. I mean, people, people throw around that term escapism like it's derogatory. And, you know, sometimes it is a bad thing, but I think a lot of times uh, fiction, in fiction, it's a good thing to have a book or a movie or something that does let you get away from the life you're in. I, I think it's just a, cl a, a case of too much of anything is, is no good for you. But I think um, um, healthy doses of escapism I mean, for me, are mandatory. It's the only way I get through life. Same here. You know, whether it's, you know, me creating, me reading somebody else's books, comic books, video game, movie, whatever it is, um, I need that. Mm. I need that to function. Um, well, and that's, that's actually one of my issues with some of the, the recent, all the grim, dark fantasy. I can appreciate what they're doing. I can admire the stuckle that goes into it. I've I've enjoyed some of the books and shows and other movies and things like that. But ultimately, life is grim enough already. You know, I don't really I don't need to read more of that day to day. I like when the hero or the heroine beats the bad guy and yes. things turn out well at the end of the story. Yes, I'm a fan of that as well. Now, but here's here's where I'll put I apply I think as in, in my in my underlying hardwiring, I'm an artist. So many times I apply artistic principles to my writing. And so when you look at a painting, the artist creates the area of most contrast to direct the eye, right? Where the lightest lights and the darkest darks are. Usually if it's a portrait, it's on the face somewhere, right? You're not going to make it a button or something. You know what I mean? And, and the, the more vivid, the more dark the darks, the more brighter the whites, right? If you have like a gray, if you put white next to it, it's never quite as bright as it is if you put black. You know, if you put black next to white, it becomes more cut. Right? The writing is the same way, I feel. If the subject is just dark, 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 and never gets light, not only does it lose its darkness, because then it just becomes monochromatic. You're like, all right, it's just going to be dark creepiness. And I don't have any light, so I don't get any sense of balance. But it 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 also, you don't you for me, you don't reach a catharsis. You don't you don't exhale. You're this is so bad, this is so bad, this is so bad, and now it's over. You know what I mean? You need that. You need the good guys to win. It doesn't have to be a big win, but you need to like oh god, that's or, or if it, you can play it the other way, you can have it that uh, you know things are good, things are things are good, things are good, and then at the very end things are bad. And now, 
you know, that's the kind of the classic definition of a tragedy, although sometimes a tragedy is things are bad, things are bad, things are bad, now they're worse. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I agree with you, and I think that, you know, if you take all of the classic tropes of storytelling, especially heroic fantasy, and you simply invert them, that's not necessarily any more realistic than, than the original tropes were. It's simply a mirror. And in its own way, it ends up becoming as predictable and boring, I think, as, you know, whatever it is you might be trying to comment on. So, yeah, that's definitely been my feeling as well. You know, it, it, I enjoy the variations on the different stories. I enjoy different takes on them. But if there isn't at least some hope and optimism in them, at a certain point, it just wears on your soul. And you start going, you know, why, why am I putting up with this, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were definitely times... When, in, when I was younger, when I was a teen and kind of angsty and pissy, that I liked that stuff. And it was perfect. But then, I, I mean, I, I grew past it, and then I needed there to be lightness. Because, as you said, I think that you flick on the news, and the world can be... You, it's easy to get become jaded and cynical about the world we live in, because it can be so dark sometimes. And, um, and I, need, I can't have that in my escapism. I can have doses of it, I can have it in a way that the author or the storyteller is trying to process the real world the same way I'm trying to do it. I get that, but I can't just, I can't mire in it. I, it's, I don't have it in me anymore. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I think uh, is kind of viewers might find kind of interesting is we actually have a, a sort of an unusual connection as well, which is you painted the cover for Jeremy Thatcher Dragon Hatcher. You painted a second. It was a, it was a, it was one of the anniversary covers, wasn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. An yeah. anniversary cover. Yeah. And that's actually the book that got me to write Aragon in the first place. So I remember I was scrolling through your the, your, the art on your website, and I, I saw the image of that and saw that you'd done the cover. I was like, what? Really? Seriously? <laughs> so. My stock went, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, I've been very fortunate. Um, to have illustrated for a lot of pretty amazing um, authors, and Bruce Colville is certainly one of them. And those Magic Shop books are fantastic. I loved mm -hmm. each and every one of them. Um, they were really great. I um, I got to do an Anne McCaffrey Pern book. I don't know if I ever told you that. You know, one no, of the, I didn't know that. I, I got to repackage Dragonflight, the first one. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I did. I got to redesign the dragons, and I got you know did Lessa and all the and the thread. You know, coming <laughs> in <laughs> the thread. Um, I got to do Tolkien's Unfinished Tales mm. uh, right before all the movies came out. Del Rey contacted me, and, and I got to do that, which was definitely an I'm not worthy moment. Um, so I've been very, very fortunate, I feel. Uh, one of these days, I'd love to get you to draw one of my dragons. if we can Absolutely. An yeah. Anniversary edition or something. Maybe yes. I'll, I'll get Random House to do a Sephira uh, give you a call. or something. Yeah. Oh, man, right. I would love that. I would love that. I love a dragon. They're hard. I mean, you and I have talked a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that, that um, designing an original dragon is absolutely one of the toughest things to do oh, yeah. because they've been rendered countless times. When I started out writing Aragon, I'd read so much fantasy and yet I felt like no one had quite gotten dragons right, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Because because even even with Tolkien or Ursula Le Guin, I'd be reading, going, yeah, I really, really like this. I would just do this one little thing differently. Yeah. So my dragons were perfect for me. Yeah. Uh, and it, I think it's just the same way. I mean, designing a good dragon is, is very, very hard. I think that's good advice for any young writers out there, actually, because I think that's a really good core motivational thing that they should hold on to, that if you're reading... Uh, a book by Christopher Paolini or Tony DiDolizzi, and you're like, oh, man, I would do it this way. You should go do that. You definitely should go do your version of it because that's totally how I – my early stuff, that's all I was trying to do was like how would I write my version of this? I mean the, the Spiderwick Field Guide is my version of Brian Frown Nounley's Fairies. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's it's totally coming from that. Being taking the inspiration um and turning it into creativity. Yeah, I and I think uh I think readers sometimes underestimate how many times a book that an author writes is not something that came out of the ether. It's usually a commentary or a reaction to something that the author has already read or watched and has thought about and said, you know, I like this, but I didn't like this, and so I wanted I want to comment on that in some way and play on that. Yeah. Well, along with that, given that you started out uh, very young with all this, the same way I did, and get your experience with all this, is, is there any other 
advice you would give out give to writers or artists who are starting out uh, nowadays? And I know the you know the media landscape has changed dramatically just even in the past ten years, but still, you know, the basics are the still still hold true. The basics are the basics, and I think one of the big things is um, you can't be shy. And you can't be too precious with it. You know this is, is probably better than anybody. You've got to go out there and share. If you want to make a living at it, you and I are storytellers who are hoping people like what we're saying. They like the stories that we're spinning. That's how we make our living. And so you have to develop a thick skin um, for feedback, uh, for, for whether someone likes it or not. And, and you have to be willing to share it. And I, I, I have often been like at a high school or a book signing and someone, come, a college kid would come up to me and go, oh, I've written something or I've drawn something. I'm like, let me take a look at it. And they're like, they're shy. And I'm like, you can't be shy. You cannot be shy. You've got to be, put it out there. Tell me what you think. Give me your opinion, good, bad, or otherwise. I'll take it. I'll digest it and I'll move on. And you've got to have that in, in, for the industry that we're in. We are making stories for consumption. That's what we do. And uh, you've got to be able to, to uh, take the feedback. And then once it's published or released, you have to be able to ignore the, the haters because there are going to be haters no matter, how, no matter how well you write, no matter how well you paint. Someone somewhere is not going to like your work and is going to go on the internet and is going to say so very, very loudly. And <laughs> you just have to accept that as, as not, not just the price of admission, so to speak, but in some ways that is proof that you are reaching people, that you even yes. got a reaction like that. At all. Have you gotten that? Have you received the, the recipient of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, at one point, I don't know if it's still going, but there was at least one or two hate sites devoted to me. So, oh my gosh. The Part of it was the age I got published at, which I think attracted more attention, negative attention, than I would have gotten otherwise. Right. Um, and, you know, it was also difficult for me because I got published when I did and then sort of got locked into spending the next 10 years writing a story I started when I was 15. Yeah. And so sometimes the criticisms that would come along, there were, you know, now and then there were some valid critiques of the series. And I'd say, you know, yeah, I can see that. But given what I had already set up in the series, you know, here I am, at, here, there I was at 27, 28, yeah. still working on for, <laughs> what I'd started. For better or for 15. worse, right? I'm for better or for worse. Right, that's right. Um, and that could, that could be frustrating. So it's sure. nice to be... Um, as much as I love the inheritance cycle and I don't feel any need to apologize for it, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. It's nice to be moving on to something new to sort of try my hand at something new. And yeah. ho hopefully readers will, will enjoy it as much or even more. Well, you know, I mean, this is an interesting concept with the launch of your career. The question becomes, w did you get the press because you are a young uh, prodigy or did you, or was it the story and, 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 you know, you have fantasy in a, in a great time, right? It was a great time to make fantasy. It couldn't have been better, right? And so you had like these two amazing things happening. But at some point now, when you look back, do you think like, were they just focused on me because I was a kid? Or were they actually, did they care about my, my story? Well, I, I think that I got more press than I might have otherwise because of my age. But given yeah. the enduring popularity of the series and yeah. I, I know it was the story ultimately because I'm sure you've seen this as well uh, you know new authors who have a book that comes out and it gets really hyped very hard and pushed very hard by the publisher yeah. you know and it sells better than average because of the attention it gets but it just never takes off that's and right you, you know people people overestimate the effects of publicity sometimes I think you can buy a certain amount of sales but you can't buy a true phenomenon you know, you can't. You just no. can't. Or maybe I should, no. is it phenomena? Phenomenon? Yeah, I always get that mixed do, up. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you can't. You can't buy a Hunger Games. You can't buy a Harry Potter. No. Um, no. So no, I mean, at a certain point when I I didn't know myself, but at a certain point when the series was continued to be popular and extremely popular, I was like, okay, no, it's it really is the books and it is the series and the writing and. I would agree. Yeah, I would. I would. I definitely think it was a long burn. It wasn't a, a short, fast burn. No, no. And and I also think that it's important for people to know that 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 uh, Joe Rowling and and Suzanne Collins they didn't know. You didn't know when you were making. You weren't like, well, this is going to be. You know, I mean, you don't you don't think that at all. You're just like, 
how can I make this book? And I, was, I hope people like it. And I, I was trying to do the same thing you were, which was write the sort of book I wanted to read, and I felt like it wasn't in the marketplace. And if I had tried to consciously write a bestseller, I would have written a pastiche of Tom Clancy, uh, John Grisham, and Stephen King. You know, because that was those those were the big guys in the '90s, and Stephen King's still going. Did you get an unauthorized guy? Did they ever do like an unauthorized like book to Allegasia? Did they ever do? Uh, I did an authorized book. We had an unauthorized guide to Spiderwick, and I thought that we've we've really achieved some kind of success. If if another book can actually exist in the world that's just based on our book, there was a guy in Italy who wrote two spoof books based off of mine. Like they were like nice. They're like you know uh, mad style spoof as spoofs. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He turned the main character. He's Aragon's cousin, and he rides a giant purple turkey. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> As you do. So I think my favorite part, and it's all in Italian, but my favorite part is that instead of having beautiful uh, songs that the elves do and elvish and everything, they're actually singing uh, the Italian version of uh, Raindrops Are Falling on My Head. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Tony. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I hope we can do this again sometime. Sounds good. 